and we are recording, I think, recording, recording on Zoom, recording on QuickTime Player, ba -dum -ba -dum. Um, so, haven't done a solo rant in a while, and I wasn't going to, not to guest shame anybody, Aaron Shepard, but uh, my guest bailed, Aaron Shepard. No, it's fine. Um, so, I haven't done a solo rant in a while. And that's what I call these is, I just got back from work. That's what I call these are solar rants. It's where I, quote unquote, just get in front of the camera and yell for an hour like a psychopath on a soapbox. And that's what I'm going to do. Nothing I say in these rants are uh, what I fully believe. They are just, I'm channeling my Alex Jones. Jesus, I got some killer acne going on. I channel my Alex Jones and I just start yelling. Um and going with whatever's off the top of my head. And I try to cite things from memory. That's I, I don't look anything up. I try to cite from memory. And um, I don't know what the thesis is until the end of the episode. So I don't actually, it's a lot like graphic design actually, where you're trying to make like an art piece and you don't know what the fuck it is that you're making until it's almost finished. And what an arrogant thing to call it an art piece. It's a fucking piece of shit. Point being, some random things on my mind. So, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to look at the, the, the big picture of shit. And I'm not entirely sure how to look at it. So, I, I, if, I, because I clearly always start with this. Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. Come on, don't fucking cut out on me now. Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. He talks about these, like, uh, nuclear, these nuclear uh, flash detectors that were put on the top of telephone poles all throughout America. Just like little things the size of like a small trash can, maybe like a beach ball put on top of telephone poles that could register the gamma, the gamma flash and the x-ray flash of a nuclear weapon, obviously leaving ground zero at light speed, um, and which actually are unique from even supernovas. It doesn't necessarily mean they're stronger. It just means that they have their own unique signature. And this is all declassified shit. This is in the book Raven Rock by Garrett Graff, who's a professor at Georgetown and is a top writer for Politico. He also has another great book called Dawn of the Code War, as well as The Last Plane in the Sky and uh, The Threat Matrix. He's a fucking awesome author. Um, but yeah, so he talks about this in Raven Rock. And the purpose of these things was that they, they could detect the flash of an atomic bomb um, and send the signal to the Pentagon or whatever the, wherever the relay office was. And it wouldn't even necessarily be a signal so much as it would be the absence of a signal. You know, it's something like it shoots, you know, it's like something crazy. Even back in like the 60s, it was like it pulsed three times a second. And on a side note, there's always kind of a funny thing I think about is how how conspiracy that sounds if you didn't know it now in 2020. I mean, this book came out like what, last year, maybe two years ago. How conspiratorial that sounds and how conspiratorial that would be taken if you said it in the 50s, like, no, not on a military base, not in the White House, but here in fucking suburban Atlanta, you see that light pole, you see that telephone pole, see that little white thing on top? Yeah, Grandpa, that's a transformer. No, that is a gamma ray flash detector. For what? For if the Soviets drop multi-megaton thermonuclear warheads scattered from a MIRV coming in at Mach 23, shot from liquid-fueled rockets on the other side of the world. Okay, Grandpa. No, that's what it is, I swear. But that's really what it was. Another, another crazy one is to think of, think right, right after World War II, and really up until then, and right up until after, there was pretty much, I would say, I would argue, until Vietnam, maybe you could even argue Korea, um, pretty unwavering trust in, the, in Uncle Sam, right? For better or worse, I'm not trying to go into that. It's just that's what the generation was. And you, can, you could argue that that's uh, information control propaganda had on John Bennett yesterday, a guy who grew up in a cult, and he talks about that. But for whatever reason, it's just, you know, Uncle Sam does have the best interest. Then again, those were more justified wars as opposed to we got to go get these people because they're practicing a different economic doctrine than us. Instead, it was here is a megalomaniacal, well-funded, technologically advanced superpower that's incinerating people of a certain ethnic group via train systems. It seems a little more justified. Point being, there is more of an unwavering trust in Uncle Sam back then. 
So imagine if, imagine if someone wandered out into the desert, maybe Groom Lake, maybe, I don't know, maybe Tonopah, somewhere in the Nevada test site. Uh, what is the, what's the, um, shit, what's the proving ground one? Um, I'm blanking. Um, what if they went out there and they found a, a, uh, a top secret base. Well, first of all, there wouldn't be a top secret base. Why would Uncle Sam lie from us? Lie to us? All right. What are they doing at that base? Well, they're they're building rockets. They're building rockets. Yeah, they're gonna building rockets and they're gonna try to go to the moon. And really more importantly, they're gonna try to lob nukes across the world. Nukes. Well, yeah, not atomic bombs, but there's a new one called a hydrogen bomb. You mean the one we dropped on the Japs? Yeah, but but no, because it's about a thousand times stronger. So you're telling me Uncle Sam's lying to me and that we got a base out there? Yeah. And you're telling me they've got a super nuclear bomb bigger than the one we dropped in World War II? Yeah, about a thousand times bigger. But they're not even going to drop these from an Enola Gay or a boxcar. No, we're gonna uh, we're gonna we're gonna put them on a missile. You mean like the V two? No, it's gonna go. We're not going to launch them a couple hundred miles. We're going to launch them from our backyard into the Soviet Union. So you've got a secret base that Uncle Sam's not telling me about with bombs a thousand times stronger than the atomic bomb. And you're going to launch rockets across the world. Yeah. All right. All right. How are we going to do that? I don't know if you guys remember, but the V2 was pretty uh, dangerous in World War II. And um, good thing. But hey, I don't know how dangerous they are because we killed all those guys. About that. We, we killed a lot of them. We killed a, 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 we killed a whole lot of them. Except for like some of them. What do you mean except for some of them? I just, you know, I don't know. <laughs> eh, yeah. What was that? 33,000? You didn't. So you didn't kill thirty three thousand Nazis. Well, you still interrogating them. Um, eh, eh, kind of. They're they're living here. They're living here in prisons. Mm, mm, I mean, not quite prisons. So they're making them work on the rocket program. Yeah, we're making them work on the rocket program. We're not paying them, right? Ah. You know, that's what what his payment really mean. Okay, surely no one in the government knows about this. Uh, uh, right. Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay? Eh, maybe Curtis LeMay. So you're telling me this beloved general has brought over 33,000 Nazis, and not only are we not killing them, not only are we not detaining them, not only are they not working here, but we're paying them? Maybe. On a secret base, we're going to send rockets across the world at Mach 23 carrying bombs a thousand times stronger than the Hiroshima bomb. Do I, do I got the picture? Yeah, pretty much. We're also going to go to the moon. What? <clears throat> Gotta go, you know? But that is exactly what fucking happened. That is exactly what happened. And so, although we now know it all in hindsight, and we can say, yeah, you know, reality is stranger than fiction, but that actually happened, Okay. So think about that. Think about nuclear bunker systems, the relocation arc. Again, Raven Rock by Garrett Graff. It's the best fucking book you'll ever read or listen to on, Aud on Audible. Garrett Graff, G-R-A-F-F, -F, Raven Rock. That whole system of bunkers, which even back in the 50s, and it's not just you think NORAD, sure, under the White House, sure, SIDAR, sure, Mount Weather, no thousands thousands of bunkers that not just norad were literally a lot of them were built on they had cushioned springs under them even the plumbing had give with springs and rubber um what's the word gaskets e, uh, hardened against emps as well as bunker busting nukes and we had them and when when the bombs would go off because obviously everything above ground would be wiped out. They literally had auto automated bulldozers that could come out, push the rubble off a uh, what looked like a silo. That would open up, 
and then a new antenna would come out so we could reestablish communication. They had several of these in case there were just waves of nukes. We could just keep, chop one off, we could go Hydra and just bring out another one, right? I mean, think about that. But that was denied to the public. That was denied to a lot of people in D.C. I mean, Gary Graff talks about it. He says, um, what was it? it was during the, what was the show? It was, was it a show or a movie? Elevator or Cultural Rock? It was like Homeland or House of Cards or it was, it was something where, in for whatever reason, one of the episodes or part of the movie had in a, a, a scene where they were evacuated to bunkers. And as they were getting on the helicopters and there are armed Marines uh, guided to, or directed to shoot anyone that doesn't have the, you pull it out and it's a little gold like ID with like braids on it. And when they put that in the movie, there was a woman who was working on the movie set who was the, um, fuck, what's the, what's the word for the, not, not press, press, I should know that press secretary whoever yeah whatever that yeah you, you know what i'm talking about the person that takes all the questions that woman who was the press secretary for uh the clinton administration had you know this is 20 years later had had been got you know landed herself a job on this movie set for realism right it's maybe you'd, if you're making a war movie maybe you'd want some actual war veterans well, they bring her on because it's all about the DC, DC, the House of Cards, the you know the sex, the scandals, the briberies. And she said, "You got to take that part out because that's it's too Hollywood, it's too sexy, it doesn't actually exist." I know I was the you know I was the the press secretary. Well, they that movie set had also hired someone else who was even higher up in the Clinton administration who said they do exist you just didn't get one <laughs> like think about that so painting this whole thing to say that this insane shit that we say can't happen happens nukes i mean even think about that what are you doing the biggest bomb up until that point was i believe a british creation called the grand slam and i want to say it had the explosive power of twenty-two thousand pounds of tnt so 11 tons so 0.011 kilotons, right? Yeah. Okay. Hiroshima is 15 kilotons. Think about that. And what is it? And how much does it weigh? It's, you know, it's not that big. Maybe the size of like a tank, small tank. The amount of, uh, oh, fuck, which one, which one was um, Hiroshima? One of them was, was uranium and a gun type, and one of them was plutonium and a implosion type. I think plutonium implosion was Nagasaki. And I think that was 20 megatons. And then uranium gun type was Hiroshima, I think. But, yeah, the one detonated over Hiroshima before, because it's not, obviously, it's not 100% efficient. A lot of the fissile material gets blown away by the actual, you know, nuclear explosion. But the actual mass of, uh, of I didn't sleep well last night, sorry. The actual mass of uranium that was turned to energy was less than the weight of a dollar bill. So point, the point of all this is, so think of how crazy that is and think about the, the bunker system. Think about using Nazis in a secret base in the desert to shoot rockets at the moon with hydrogen bombs. When we look at all of these things in hindsight, it seems that we have to open our minds to things that may stretch the imagination now. And you got to be careful with that because that's not a blank check to say everything's true. The earth is flat and we're run by lizard people. No, that's retarded. But you can't just write everything off as it's impossible, right? And so I think you have to take into consideration that there, there's probably things going on. Where I would say a, not only a non-zero chance, I would say an above 51% chance that there are things going on right now 
and not just the given classified shit. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Because a, a classification is sure, like you, there's always going to be a classified plane that flies a little faster than we thought it could, or you know, better stealth or whatever. Yeah, 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 I get that. But that's like the the sort of what kind of got Rumsfeldian, the, the known unknown. There's the known knowns, the known unknowns, and then the unknown unknowns. I'm talking about the unknown unknowns. Like obviously, there you know, D-Day was highly secretive. Um, testing. Uh, um, airplane engines in World War II up in uh, Mount Washington in New Hampshire because they could put it up because that for the longest time that had the fastest winds in the world. I think the record was 232 miles an hour. And they would test it up there because, hey, free wind tunnel. But it's also you're in the middle of fucking nowhere. Mount Washington will kill you in the middle of the summer. And so it kind of, it kind of guarded itself. And you're in the woods and no one really, you couldn't, you couldn't go in there. But if it came out years later that that was happening okay sure you know all right yeah i get it um airplane factories underground with you know big fake uh hills over them like the foliage the fake uh the faux trees you know like a thousand acres of it okay still a little nuts but i got it but i mean something like even the telephone pole nuke detectors crazy but it still has its, it still has one toe in the pool of like known unknowns, right? It's it's still it's it gets a little it starts to get a little crazier, right? Maybe a thing outside your house is linked to the Pentagon. But on the other hand, I mean, that's kind of just an extrapolation of radar of sky watchers during um, uh, a great book, Command and Control, by Eric Schlosser, the guy that wrote Fast Food Nation. They talk about was it or was that Raven Rock too? Fucking a lot of M's. Garrett M. Graff, Eric M. Schlosser. Actually, that's two M's, not a whole lot. <laughs> but that's still, that's kind of an extrapolation of an existing thing, right? It gets a little crazier. It starts to move from the kiddie pool of expected secrecy, jet engines, where they're testing them, D-Day, airplane factories underground. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Kevin gets a little crazier. But Nazi scientists on American soil getting paid big bucks to send liquid-fueled rockets across the world carrying bombs a thousand times stronger than the one that was dropped on Hiroshima and then eventually to put fucking men on the moon and drive a car around. And then when they get out of their golf cart, they play golf. And then come home. <laughs> yeah. You have to embrace that they're there is a greater chance than not in the truest sense of that phrase. So in a, a 51 or a, say a 50.1 or you, you know, under 333 of uh, repeating, of course, Leroy Jenkins, there is a greater chance than not that there is some insane shit going on in our, in now, not the PCA, the sixth generation, um, NGAD, um, fuck, uh, next generation air dominance. I just had a hot pocket and it's making my belly go burbles. I'm a grown man. NGAD, which is also the PCA, kind of the, they're the same thing, interchangeable terms. NGAD, next generation air dominance, and PCA, penetrating counter air, LOL. Sixth generation fighter, basically the one without any vertical stabilizers, right? Okay, yeah, you get it. B 21 Raider, eh, got it, right, whatever. X 37B. I don't know. I don't really take that as secret because they're, oh, it's super secret. It's super secret. This thing has been up in space for 900 days. It's super secret. No one knows what it's doing. Now it's been up for 1,007 days. It's super secret. Well, how the fuck am I reading about it? And how did you find out about it? So, you know, it doesn't really seem that secret. There's got to be something. And what that thing is, I don't know. But because this is my podcast, let's speculate wildly. Sounds like a good idea, Tommy. Thanks, Tommy. Here's video evidence of my descent into madness. But, I mean, even looking at something like Orion, Project Orion, right, where we're going to blow up nuclear bombs behind a massive pusher plate and accelerate a spaceship to a, a decent percentage of the speed of light. And then there is, of course, there is the Orion battleship, which was just going to go in orbit, and it was just going to aim its cannons, just like the Ohio-class ship, except much bigger and aiming nuclear shells at earth from orbit gets a little crazy kennedy said i don't want to do that so they said well we don't want you and you know 
give him an autopsy. But <laughs> Cadillac healthcare plan, right? It was, it was his car a Cadillac? <laughs> um, <laughs> so that gets a little crazy. SDI, that gets a little crazy, right? Lieutenant General James Abramson, who I've tried to get on this podcast. He is the head of SDI under Reagan. Cannot get in touch with him, but I know he's still alive, and I know he's still working for a defense contractor. As well. I know he's still, you know, sharp as a tack. I'd love to get him on. The off chance you're listening, sir, please come on here. Um, but, I mean, they had things where they were shooting lasers through the sky, directed energy weapons, and because – uh, the same phenomena that causes sparkling or the top stars to twinkle, whatever the diffusion, diffraction, effusion, whatever the hell it is. The satellites in space that caught the laser and then redirected it, they were going to have these um, semi, um, what, am, what am I looking for? <sighs> Malleable, movable, bendable mirrors. These mirrors that had to be like as precise as Hubble but they were also going to be moving. Well, how, oh, you, you may pivot? No. I mean, the surface would move. It would have thousands, tens of thousands of little uh, piezoelectric drivers, pushers and drivers that would, could deform the surface like a contact to kind of reform the light. Okay, that's pretty crazy, right? In the 80s, yeah. And it did it a thousand times a second. It wasn't just, you know, to go to the doctors and it's, you know, which is better, left, right, left, right. It wasn't just, yeah, you get it right, and then we're good. We do a zap the Soviet nukes. No, this would do it a thousand times a second. And we, we mastered that in the 80s, right? They were going to send up thousands of, uh, they would call, they called them garages, G-A-R-A-G-E, of, um, of essentially surface-to-air missiles, but you put them in space and there's no, the no, no, no such thing is no gravity. The effect is infinite, but it would, it's, it's like the same reason they can make like a rocket sled go faster than they can make a rocket because a rocket's going up and has to fight gravity. Rocket sled, you put it on the ground and it's for all intents and purposes, it's kind of voided out gravity. That's why you can get them going hypersonic in like no time. Um, but it's the same thing. We'd have these in space. There'd be no air resistance. You wouldn't have to, they wouldn't be launched from the ground. They would, the garage would just be floating up there. These things, would be, so we're going to have surface-to-air missiles, thousands of them, and little, each garage would have, to have anywhere from like 5 to 25. But we'd have these things flying around that could just shoot fucking rockets in space in the 80s. All right? Okay. What, Reagan got out of office in what, 88? I mean, Nintendo 64 came out like 10 years later. <laughs> like, right? Star Fox. Do a barrel roll. Um, but so if we can look at all of that, what is out, what, what would be in 2020, what would be the thing that is crazy to us and not an acceptable, not, uh, not an acceptable, um, a predictable, no, 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 known or a known unknown. What would be the unknown unknown? And obviously again, that is a blank check because you can just put anything, but what would it actually be? I would argue that right now, October 24th, October 24th, 2023 or 9 p.m. Eastern time. I would argue that not just like feasible in a lab or on paper. I would argue that right now we have a, and full ahead time we have a fully deployed space weapon system not rods from god because even that is that's i feel like that's old we're just throwing a mass right come on that's caveman shit i would argue right now that we have an entire constellation of satellites above the world at what height i don't know i mean in the 80s norad was tasked with not co- not just covering all of uh, north america but all all aerospace, air and space, out to 23,000 miles in a sphere, which came out to, ah, fuck, what was it? It was, um, no, it was 22,000 miles. And the number came out to 20, 20, 27, 27 trillion cubic, 
cubic miles of airspace. That sounds like bullshit, right? No. Discovery Channel. NORAD, Cheyenne Mountain Complex. Cheyenne Mountain. Why the fuck I just did? It's Cheyenne Mountain, don't you know? I mean, it's crazy. You got all these people up there. They're shooting at planes that aren't even ours. And I'm just like, come on. I'm not doing that. 27 trillion cubic miles. It might have been 22 trillion. It was over 20 trillion cubic fucking miles, okay? So I would argue that right now we have a fully deployed system. At what height? I don't know. Space stations at what? 220 miles. I don't know. Let's say it's um, geosynchronous, right? What's that? 36,500 miles. Geosynchronous. I would say it's a whole, I would say it's probably a sphere. If not an X, at least an X and Y axis. Directed energy. So light speed. 186,000 miles a second. So 186,000 miles a second, that's around the circumference of the Earth seven and a half times per second. So let's see. 220 miles. I feel like that's too low. I feel like you'd spot it. So let's say 36,000 miles. So what's, we'll just call it 36 even, 36, 72, 144. Throw another 30 on that one. Eight, four, we'll call it. We'll call it five. So we could do that. So we could do that distance five times in one second, which means it would take two tenths of a second to hit Earth. So, all right, that's an acceptable margin of error. If not, it, but if it's even closer, it just gets crazier. I would say that there is an entire web of space-based directed energy weapons in geosynchronous orbit that are plausibly deniable and leave no, uh, no signature. Yeah. I would say, yeah. Cause I mean, what is the, I mean, why were we so, why were we willing? Julie, it wasn't James Abramson. It might've been wild, wild Bill Donovan, the guy that created the CIA. It might've been Richard Bissell, Eisenhower's hatchet man. I fucking don't is one of these guys said about bringing back, Operation Paper or starting Operation Paperclip and then Operation Paperclip 2 and I think it was Accelerated Paperclip they had all these different names it was all the same it was all a bunch of euphemisms it's, hey, bring in more Nazis but what he said is you know like a true kind of military tactician is let's not I think the exact quote was let's not beat a dead Nazi horse meaning we fucking won they're done Hitler's dead there are some that are still alive and we know the Soviet it's just it's not that we're all just going to kill them and agree that we all killed them. We know the Soviets got a third of them. We know it's a third because, well, we have the other two thirds. But we know we got them. And we know the Soviets are our next enemy, right? Obviously, there's the massive buildup of weapons. Soviets go to Manchuria. We know that they know that we have the nuke because they had Klaus Fuchs and was it the Rosenbergs in the Manhattan, in, um, yeah, in, in the Manhattan Project? So we know that. I mean, they detonated their first nuke, Joe 1, in 1949. I want to say 1949. And we knew that because the head of the NKVD, uh, Valenti Berioff, he was ruthless, and we knew that he was going to set it off. And uh, we detected that with a sniffer plane off the coast of, of Alaska. We got a massive radiation cloud. Which, why were they even up there sniffing? It just I mean, we had sniffer planes apparently just fucking going out there on a random fall evening in 1949. And the, that's crazy because we didn't even know that – we didn't think that they were going to test it. I think we thought that they couldn't get an atomic bomb until 54, which means that we didn't just have a sniffer out there because we were looking for a bomb. That just means we had a sniffer plane out there. Why? Why? <laughs> which means well, you can only draw the conclusion that there must have been sniffer planes everywhere, right? So – So we know we so so if we're willing to bring back Nazis for that, right? And so the the point of all that. So, so what's the purpose of that, though, right? Well, because bombers, you send B seventeens, B twenty nines, you send all those up. You got to send a thousand of them. You got to send them at night, or you got to send them in even bigger waves during the day. You got to apply formation. Shout out Curtis May. 
But we had the was it the five oh ninth, I think, the five oh ninth atomic bombing win, which they called them they called them the, the nickel plates, the nickel plated. And it was a fleet of B twenty nine specifically basically we just duplicated the Enola game. They're specifically modified to just carry one big old fucking bomb. Which LeMay actually had these weird kind of poetic notes he'd write in his like in the margins of his books. And one of them was like, What a beautiful thing atomic bombs are. They cling to the belly of a plane, much like a baby in the pouch of its mother, fly across the world, released under the ground, and they bruise the heavens and the earth. <laughs> just a little May, just doodling about nuclear weapons, just, ah, strategic air command, LeMay, just heart, heart, heart. Um, shout out, Curtis LeMay. Um, bombs away, LeMay. So that whole thing, though, was and and what did LeMay say when he um, after the war? Because right, because LeMay went in. <sighs> what when we went to Europe? When the fuck was that? Forty two. LeMay went in and he was kind of the hard charger, right? He went in and he saw that the rate that we were losing B twenty nines, coupled with the rate that we are producing and replacing, so just the obvious difference before FDR went all big dick energy and was like, we're going to exact quote from FDR. We're going to build a fucking whole lot of titties of planes. Exact quote. Not a lot of people know that. Um, he saw that at the rate that we were losing them, or plus the rate that we were gain, or building them, obviously a negative rate. He said that we had 30 days until we no longer had an air force. Nazis are still going fucking strong, right? He said, I will never forget how unprepared we were. And that's why he was so hell-bent on creating Strategic Air Command, um, right? That's why he took the position in Offutt, O-F-F-U-T-T, -T, right? I think that's where Bush landed on 9-11, right? And that was in Omaha. And he took it, and he went through base to base because he got there and he looked at their bombing statistics and he was like, I don't fucking believe any of this because LeMay, you know, LeMay was, LeMay was cocky, but he also was well-deserved because LeMay was always the front man in the formations, right? LeMay, LeMay was like a George Washington motherfucker, right? He was like, where's the leader? And he's like, the leader is farther up than you are, right? The leader's up there fucking, I just imagine just smoking a cigar and just shooting fucking redcoats. LeMay was up there in the first fucking plane. I mean, you can only imagine with a cigar is just this, you know, when there was oh, when there was bombers on the flight line, I think B fifty twos, and there was all this like jet fuel on the ground, he would go out smoking a cigar. And I remember, and, and there's a quote where, why did I say I remember? I remember when I was there. There was a quote where some some officer was like, uh, "Sir, like you can't smoke a cigar out here. Like there's you know just you know gestures wildly at the thousands of gallons of jet fuel on the ground with the whole fleet of B fifty twos. He says, if you light if if that falls, it might light the jet fuel, and then the planes will burn." And LeMay looked at the planes and said, they wouldn't dare. <laughs> Just like, fuck off. But um, LeMay didn't give a fuck. Uh, Richard Rhodes said that LeMay's fleet of bombers took off from islands in the South Pacific like a thousand throwing stars glinting in the sun. You gotta just love that irony, using the throwing stars against Japanese. But yeah, so LeMay didn't give a fuck. LeMay was head out there. He, LeMay had a really bad relationship with his father, I believe. But he was a boss, and he was a fucking American. Fuck all of you communists out there. And God bless your ability to be a communist. That's what makes America great. Point being is, yeah, LeMay was all about that, right? That's why LeMay was pushing for the XP-70 Valkyrie, right? Mach 3, sustained Mach 3. If you were to look at this thing, this thing looked like, like the, like the SR-71 Blackbird had the parasitic D-21. It was also, it was actually called the, they called it, I think they called the SR-71 that, they, they called it like the m SM or something. It was M. No, I think they called it M21 from Mothership, and it had the D21 on its back, which really just kind of looked like a mini, um, mini SR71. It was called the D21 Tag Board, T A G B O A R D, and this fucker was radio controlled, would have predetermined flight paths, and it would pop off the back of the SR71, and this thing would go up to 90 to 105,000 feet. This is all in the 60s and the 70s when we were uh, surve surve surveilling, surveilling, spying on, flying over, just dragging a huge American Eagle dick across Red China, looking out there, uh, looking for their nuclear sites, right? We did that. 
and it would fly along and then it would get its shit and it would go out to the ocean, deploy the, the, the goods out in a parachute. And you could see how this was the predecessor to the Corona satellites because a, a, a ship would come, or not a ship, a, a, a plane would come along and it would skyhook that bitch and just grab it out of the air. Never actually worked. We lost all the D-21s into the ocean. We don't actually know where they went. Fun fact, one of them crashed in Soviet Russia. I am just going off the rails, and fuck it, let's just do it, right? I just farted. Uh. <laughs> but one of, them went, one of them went up into Siberia, and um, by accident, we just didn't know. I mean, really just like throwing like model planes or like paper airplanes at your window. Just like, we were just, we had no idea what these were doing. Uh, uh, Skunk Works by Ben Rich, the, the, former, um, the, the former head of Skunk Works of Lockheed Martin. He talks about how one of these just fuckers just, just went way up into Russia and we just lost it. And we were like, fuck, all right, you know, whatever. Things top secret, we couldn't find it. Like 20 years later, um, I think it was after the fall of the of the Berlin Wall in the Soviet Union. Was that um, someone came into his office with a piece of tag board, which highly classified or was highly classified, right? Twenty years prior, of uh, this tile, this radar absorbing material, right? The thermodynamic or the the material science to survive these speeds, cold, hot, whatever, blah blah blah. And they bring it in, and he says, who's this? And he said, a CIA agent got it. And he said, where did the CIA agent get it? And the CIA agent got it from his buddy who was in the KGB, which I just like to imagine there's this whole rom-com waiting to be made where, like, you have, like, your pen pal. He's, like, your doppelganger, but he's in the opposite nation, right? But he got it, and he brought it, and apparently he gave it to the CIA guy, and the CIA guy uh, relayed that this guy was looking pretty smug because he was like, hey, we found your uh, hypersonic radar absorbing material. <laughs> Touche. We found it and we're working on it. We're reverse engineering it. But uh, hey, nod of the head to the Americans. They were like, dog, this is like 25 years old. Like, that's like finding a Game Boy and being like, <laughs> hey, Microsoft, we found your Game Boy. Slide that baby across the table. Meanwhile, they're working on the Xbox Series X, 8K, 60 FPS gaming, right? But. Point being, tag board, SR-71, blah, 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 Valkyrie, six rockets. So, so what the D-21 was to the SR-71, the SR-71 kind of looked like to the XB-70. That's how much bigger it was. This thing could carry, I think, six hydrogen bombs. You could go Mach 3 around the world at the same height and speed of the Blackbird. Uh, LeMay really wanted these for strategic air command. So what you may be thinking, what the fuck is the point of this whole rant? Well, buckle up and fucking listen. LeMay clearly... He has all this experience with it, right? This isn't just a rant. This is how I tie shit together. So stop judging me. LeMay knew how important it was to, A, so we know his importance of a, of a strategic, strategic air command, an entire uh, bomb wing, right? Because what? I will never forget how unprepared we were when we entered the war at the rate of loss. It was going to be 30 days before we were out of an Air Force. So one, so we can see where that comes from, right? That. What does he do? He creates strategic air command. What is the next thing he did? He saw the importance of early strikes. What's the second thing? XB-70, right? That's why he wanted this thing created. Because what was LeMay's logic? Does anyone remember the quote? One, bom one bomber always gets through. You can never stop 100% of bombers. That doesn't really matter for World War II when you're just dropping fire bombs and dumb bombs. But what about when they're all carrying atomic munitions, okay? So LeMay wanted, what, strategic air command, so we're always, what, prepared. And he wanted two, he always wanted one bomber to get through. And he always wanted, what, three, he knew the importance of first strike capabilities, XB-70. He really pushed for it, went to Lockheed Martin. He actually got Ben Rich to start making a... They were going to start preparing an SR-71, um, not the YF-12, the interceptor, but they are actually going to, excuse me, make one with a bombing variant. Not a lot of people know that, that there was supposed to be an SR-71 bomber, not an XB-70, but an SR-71. didn't go through. But, so we can look at all of these pieces, which are all, everything I just said in the last 20 minutes, that's all a fact. That is all a fact that we know about LeMay, Strategic Air Command, XB-70s, blah, blah, blah. All right? And obviously makes sense because who headed up Operation Paperclip to do what? 
get rockets to the other side of the world as fast as possible. Always be prepared. Unmanned, right? We see the importance of unmanned to the D21 tag board. So what is this? Okay, and when, does it make sense that who ran Operation Paperclip? LeMay, you can see where all these pieces start sliding in. And that's why he wanted that. So what is the natural extrapolation of all of this? What we're willing to do, bring back Nazis, what we're willing to do, what we want to do, SAC, always prepared, first strike capabilities, thermonuclear weapons. What do we see? That there's really nothing that we won't do, right? And I'm not trying to say biggest terrorist organization in the world is the U.S. military, rah, 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 edgy, right? I know, get your plate attendees. No, it's not that. It's that we have shown in the past, this isn't speculation, these are hard facts, that we are willing to go above and beyond to do anything to get the advantage, namely first strike capabilities and always getting one through. And then on top of all of that, secrecy. Go back to the nuclear bunkers, the nuclear flash detectors on the top of telephone poles, go to the moon, blah, blah, blah. So when you take all of those variables, and that you know they are all real. So it's almost like tracking like the, it's almost like, um, it's like if you took a slow motion video of like, if I took a handful of marbles and threw them, and they all have different rates of spin and speed and curvature. But if you could track each of those, you know, a single data point for every millisecond, you could say that these are data points per decade of what we're willing to do. Secrecy, espionage, speed, power, right? If you track all of those and you model all of them, you only need so many milliseconds before you can, if you get a strong enough computer, you can predict where they will all go. And that doesn't just mean they all go in a straight line. They're all going at different angles. Well, you predict the next second, they go another angle, another second, they go spread even farther apart, but then they start hitting the walls and bouncing around. But if you have the model, you can see where they go. No matter how strange the end product looks, you can, just like we came from a shrew that survived the, the KT impact 65 million years ago, right? If you follow the line, that's where humans come from. But if you just look at a shrew that was alive during the dinosaur that's an us, you don't see it. If you can model all of these, this handful of marbles, everything I just talked about with SAC, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's my podcast, fuck off. XB-70, SAC, thermonuclear weapons, Operation Paperclip, liquid-fueled rockets, LeMay, everything secrecy, power, strength, speed, right? If you take all of those, like the handful of marbles, and you map them and then extrapolate with them, you can paint the end image relatively, right? You can go ahead a year, a couple years, but not just that. You can go, you can model when they hit the walls and bounce around. But at a certain point, you have to go, okay, we can't model a thousand years out because we just don't have enough data. But no matter what that, so you throw the marbles, they spread out. It looks like a shotgun spread. They start hitting walls at different times. They start bouncing back. But within reason, you can predict like the weird cloud of marbles they may make as they all bounce towards the center, right? Again, within reason. If we can do that, looking at all these factors I just brought up, I don't think it is crazy at all. I mean, I think I'm crazy. And I think without that rant I just went on, it would sound crazy. I don't think it's crazy at all to say what is the natural end game. A string of satellites. One bomber always gets through, so a whole network of them. First strike capability, speed of light, two-tenths of a second to the surface. Unrelenting power, directed energy, just fucking burn it and willing to do anything to get it up there, break out our space treaties, right? We're, we're, on one hand, we're going, ah, the Nuremberg trials. And on the other hand, we're, you know, we're giving nice townhomes to, uh, to uh, Von Braun and Arthur Rudolph, right? The guys who headed Nordhausen, the rocket concentration camp facility in the Harz Mountains in Germany. The ship was straight out of a terror book. Ironically enough, that's also, those mountains were the inspiration for the, the, the Brothers Grimm books, but that's fucking... Operation Paperclip by Annie Jacobson. So if we can look at all of those, and then not only that, not only do we now know the end image that we want, right? Street, speed, strength, power. And we also know what we're willing to do to get it. But we also know that we're willing to keep it secret. Think back to the, the, the press secretary, right? The, we don't have those. No, you just didn't have one. 
if you model all of those variables, I think it starts to become not only feasible that we have a web of geosynchronous directed energy weapons, I, 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 I see it very difficult to argue against it. If we're willing to hold Nuremberg, Nuremberg in one hand and publish photos of Auschwitz and on the other hand have these guys out in the desert making big money, Von Braun, pictures of him and JFK getting all chummy. If you ever look at those pictures of him and JFK in color, they look like old Brooks Brothers ads. They're just fucking Ray-Bans. But if we're willing to do all of that, then we're willing to violate any outer space treaty. We're willing to jump leaps and bounds ahead in technology that seem like they are it's too re, too insane to be true but we always see it ends up being true and then on top of all that we're willing to do it and and mums the word and not say, not say anything and then if someone brings it up and lie about it i absolutely I, I i fully believe that and furthermore i love it <laughs> in conclusion I'm not even against it. I think it's I think it's a zero sum world. I think it's a brutal world. And uh, I don't think I don't think the United States is perfect, but I think we are the least imperfect society that's ever existed. And I will argue that until I'm dead. Yeah. I So what's the thesis of this episode? I guess it would be the argument for space web, right? Well, no, it would be not the argument. Would it be the argument? It would be, yeah, why, uh, why I guess. Yeah, my, yeah. No. A constellation of space-based directed energy weapons. An art, you know, a thesis, right? That'll be whatever the title is going to be. Be some shitty title. But I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that rant. Yeah, I'm happy with that. So let's wrap this bitch up. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, until next time, no no podcast tomorrow. I got work all day. We'll be back Monday, though. And if nobody shows up, I'm just going to go on another crazy rant on my digital soapbox. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Stay safe. Love everybody. Just because someone disagrees with you politically doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means you disagree. And what do adults do? They put it to a vote and then they go back being humans. Be nice to everyone. Love each other. Be grateful. Today is the best day of your life. Today is the last day of your life. That's what I tell myself every morning. And life's looking pretty good. So I like it. Much love, y'all.